You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, everybody, and thanks for coming back to the show once more. This is episode 335 of our podcast, Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, The Ultimate Midlife Crisis. And today's guest is another of my vintage. We have on Ted Lovett, or Bulldog, who recently finished the AT, proving yet again that you don't need to be a 20-something to hike a cut a thousand miles. You just need to have the determination and grit to follow through on what you want to do. Ted is one of those guys. He's lifelong military, so when he takes on a mission, then he'll follow through with it. Ted will be on shortly. And by the way, I I just want you to know that I do mean it when I say thanks for coming back to the show once more. You know what? In about, I don't know, it must be about three months' time, maybe less than three months, we're going to pass through two million downloads since we started. So for those of you who've listened to every episode, you've listened to, well now, 335 of them. Thank you. With more and more people coming to the end of their hikes for this year, we're also catching up with one of the Mighty Blue class of 2022, who is still on the trail. It's not been a good record for us this year. But Dan Whitesides, or Trumpet, and his dog Frankie, as usual, are having a blast. And then with less than a week until she completes her AT dream over the last 18 months, Katie Westling has finished with New Hampshire and is just three or four days from the end. We catch up with Katie in the rain. Then the vast sixth chapter of Then the Hell Came by George Stephanos. Another 20-minute slug today in one of my favourite parts of the AT in the south, the Rhone Highlands. So let's meet Ted or Bulldog. Our guest today is another one of our, I don't know, how can I put it, vintage hikers. This is Ted Lovett or Bulldog. Hey Ted, thanks for coming on the show. Hey Steve, how you doing? Well, I'm doing good. Um, and before we go any further, let's clear up my vintage description of you. How old are you, actually? I just turned 67 on the 29th of July. Which was the day you finished the trial, wasn't it? That's correct. That's correct. And uh, we're going we're to work out how that uh, how you planned that so well. Um, but yeah, you're 67, so and I'm, I'm 69, I'm 70 in a couple of weeks' time and so on. And uh, I want to talk about what it's like to hike a, as an older guy in a minute. But uh, why on earth are you bulldog? You don't look like a bulldog to me. Oh, well, I was on the I was on the trail the first uh, about the first day. I was by myself. My daughter had uh, hiked with me to mentor me about three days worth. So I was on there by myself. Came across two fellow hikers, and we were and they, you know, they as usual they asked, "Well, what's your trail name?" Well, I don't have one yet. Uh, uh, well. You know, well, you're wearing a bulldog hat. You kind of look <laughs> look like a bulldog. I had some black horn rim glasses. Right, and, right. Uh, when you when I was wearing them, it, you did kind of look like a bulldog with a beard and all. So he says, you, you just ought to go with that. Just go with that. And uh, I said, well, okay. It's not very original, but, uh, you know, but it is nice and clean and, and without, yeah. And, yeah, without uh, any funny business. So. Uh, I, it took took it and it stuck with it. So I am the bulldog. You are the bulldog. It's a great hat, by the way. He's wearing, oh. he's, he's wearing it right now as well. How do you feel? And, and some people have had different feelings about this. I know that I became mighty blue on the trail. Whoever that person is, I'm Steve at home, and you're you're obviously you know you're bulldog on the trail, but you're someone else at home. Um, did you find that you identified as bulldog, or did you identify as Ted? I was kind of a bulldog on the trail. I should have been really named Bulldozer because every time I fell, I really dug up a lot of dirt <laughs> all, all up the trail. So, uh, but no, we stuck with bulldog. I like it. I, truth be known, I graduated from the University of Georgia, so right, very appropriate. I am very the bulldog. I'm I am a bulldog fan. So, uh, so I want to support the bulldog nation there. So, 
It's really important, you know, trail names, people people say, I was actually looking on Facebook just now, people talk about trail names and so on, um, and it's surprisingly important to get one you're comfortable with, isn't it? And it you, is. you, as you say, you look like you look like it with the hat there, so it, it, it's yes. pretty cool. It is. Um, and how are you feeling? Because we're talking on August the 4th, and it's less than a week, obviously, since you finished on the 29th of July. Um, how are you? Are you okay? I'm doing good. I've... Uh... I've gone out and take uh, walk some short walks up and down the street, and uh, but uh, I'm still feel a little washed out. Uh, but uh, I'm confident I'm going to bounce back and uh, be running, you know, running four to five miles every other day, and uh, working out with my weights. And I was even jumping rope before I before I uh, left for the hike. Uh, so I'm wow. looking forward to getting back back there, get to the Y, get some swimming in. And uh, I was in a master's swimming class right before I left and uh, looking forward to getting back in the pool and getting some strokes in. Is the master's another word for vintage? It is, well, no, it's, <laughs> it's master's is a little, it's an extra, it's an extra step of trying to wear you out. It's, it's pretty, pretty, uh, they really work hard on your uh, stroke and your technique right. and, uh, and your speed. So you throw that, you know, working on your speed, it's really uh, arduous. It's one of the really? great all-body workouts, isn't it? It is. Uh, it's uh, arduous, swim. arduous swimming, arduous workout. Now, you're a, a, a former Navy captain and a Navy SEAL. Correct. How were you? How did you cope as a military man with the lack of general discipline uh, out there on the trail? Because I think it's just a very lax attitude, isn't it, out yeah. there in many, many ways. How did you cope with that? I, I didn't necessarily – Everybody, uh, there was a few hikers I met that were like totally out there, carefree. And I honestly, I appreciated that. I, I, I enjoyed being around them. I thought it was, a, it was a novelty to me, but, you know, <laughs> plan, <laughs> sure, planning, yeah. uh, <laughs> planning when you're out in a, in a austere environment, uh, out in the environment like that, uh, you, you really had to kind of plan things out for your own safety and comfort out yeah. there on the on the AT, you had more comfort than anything. Safety is really hard to kind of get in trouble out there on the AT, believe it or I not. Think, I agree. It seems to me. Seems to I, me like, I agree. I agree yeah. entirely. Yeah. But these, you know, it's funny, actually, you and I would likely not have met some of the people. Well, we definitely wouldn't have met some of the people we met on the trail. And I think all, most of us are enhanced by the experiences of meeting people who are not like us, aren't we? Exactly. Um, I did a tour, you know, I, I finished up at the Department of State in Washington, D.C., and I, uh -huh. I just enjoyed, for 12 years, I enjoyed traveling around the world and meeting different uh, people in different countries, and uh, that's the way you get smarter and yeah, yeah. and uh, and well-rounded, and uh, it's just enjoyable to, to talk to different people from different countries, and, and same, same as the trail, uh, young people, older people, retired people. Uh, my goodness, I met a gentleman that had to do a lung transplant. Jeez. And he was out there hiking. Uh, wow. Uh, incredible story there. So uh, just, just to hear the stories and, and to talk with the, the young people. I really enjoy uh, hiking with uh, around the younger people. Although I yeah. must, say, must say during the day I was by myself a lot, and I enjoyed hiking by myself. But you needed the, needed the interaction once you got to you know, your tent site or your shelter in the, e in the evening. It was, it was always good. And I had lunch with my family uh, yeah. a lot. They'd stop at noon and I'd catch up with them about five minutes later, <laughs> 10 minutes later, and we'd, we'd have lunch together. It was, it was very enjoyable. Now, you, you say you're feeling washed out. You said, said to me the other day that you've lost about 60 pounds. Um, is that some... Um, and one of that, and it happens to most people, they lose this weight and they and then they start they they can't stop eating a lot. Yeah. Are you still finding that hunger still with you? Uh, no, I've cured that. My wife's a good cook. Uh, <laughs> I've cured that. I have found the solution. Uh, uh, so I, I'm getting my strength back. Um, I've all I've always thought that at sixty pounds was like mm, this. This is not good. That's too much. Too soon. Uh, I just needed. Uh, I, I just didn't enjoy the, the the food. I would I would keep hiking, and I'd eat a little. I'd eat a candy bar through lunch. I, I mean, yeah, a protein yeah. bar through lunch, and then I would get. Uh, you know, I'd eat a nice dehydrated meal. Uh, or it's 
not it's not a culinary adventure, is it? No, it's it definitely, not. It, de- it's it definitely not. isn't that. But you have, you do tend to end. Well, I did yeah. anyway. I ended up liking a lot of food that yeah. I ate on the trail, and I hated certain food. Like oatmeal, right. I would I will never touch again as long as I live. But I could. I was just eating it every darn day. It was, it was awful. And um, and you sent me a a couple of links to your daughter's Facebook page and I read an entry that says you did the 100 mile wilderness in just three and a half days. What on earth possessed you to do that? Now, why do you feel washed out? Yeah, exactly. That was, that was some hard days. And uh, there's an argument going back and forth, whether we did it in three and a half or four and a half. All Honestly, right. I checked it this morning. I believe it was four and a half that uh, I thought I started on Sunday Mufasa, my AKA uh, Lindsay told me, no, we started on Saturday. So I had a little delirium, delirium going there. <laughs> uh, so four and a half days, that, that makes sense. Four days and six hours. That makes more sense. And I, I apologize for throwing out three and a half. I don't it's wanna... still a push. It's yeah, still a push to do it like that. Was that because you were trying to get there for your birthday? Get That's to correct. Your birthday? All That's right, correct. Okay. Yes. And, right. uh, and then, well, then we had one day, uh, we were going to have bad weather on my birthday. And so we wanted to summit the day before. Right. Okay. On the 28th. Uh, so we, we were able to get there and summit on the 28th and then we didn't have, and we were driving back on the 29th, the evening of the 29th did not, uh, want to be ex- too exhausted on the 29th to drive back to, um, Bangor, Maine for a flight back to beautiful right. Florida down here, which is 94 degrees right now. It certainly is. I'm yeah. there. I'm there yeah. myself. Oh, yeah. I got you. I got you. Uh, and we all know that support from home is really one of the building blocks of putting a through hike together. And, and of course, your family must have experienced separation from you, the military. What was their attitude like when you said you want to go away for another six months? Oh, they they fully supported it. They knew how stressful my job was, uh, on my body and mentally throughout the years, uh, uh, even at the even at the Department of State, it was it could be stressful at sure. times, and uh, it was kind of like on a short, short electronic stream all the time, st- string all the time. And uh, yeah. uh, my jobs, you could go from calm to chaos in seconds. Uh, oh my gosh! And you had to be you had to be ready to move, and so you know years years of that would would wear you down and. Yeah, sure. And uh, so my wife was fully supportive of me getting out in the woods and uh, and getting and doing what I wanted to do, you know. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been had she been giving you grief from home for oh. not wanting you to go? I had some, I, I met somebody, I'm not going to say who it was, but I met somebody on the trail and she was, she was a woman and her family missed her so much. Basically, I think they missed her doing yeah. the cleaning and the washing and the, the yeah. cooking that she, they wanted her to come home. And so she had to cut a show, her hike, which mm-hmm. didn't have to, but she said, I'm staying out for another couple, couple of hundred miles. I'll leave at 500 miles. So getting that support from home is mm-hmm. absolutely critical, isn't it? It sure is. It's critical. Yeah. Um, behind, behind every good man is a good woman and then vice, ver- <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah, uh, there better be. <laughs> it, it better, yeah. You know, it's, you have to work together. We have to, build each other up and uh she's good at that uh and then the whole family was is great uh supporting me my two yeah. daughters came out to hike the katan with me and uh, yeah we're going to talk about that one okay. in a minute, actually because that's a lo- that's a lovely thing and sisters and all are following me and uh and a lot of friends uh you know through facebook and i bet uh, so it was great I bet I bet they turn from doubters. Some of some of them turn from doubters in the beginning to sort of really cheering you on at the end. Because oh, oh, exactly. everyone everyone doubts you, really, do they? they when do. you're going to go, yeah, they do. And they, my daughter, my, my sister, sister and brother, why, why did not you pick, pick something easier like golf? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I, I just don't do easy. I don't <laughs> easy's not within me. So quite right, sir. All right. So why the early start? Or was that predicated around finishing on the J- July 29th? Was that the idea? Because you started January 29th, exactly six months before. Is that what you were planning to do? Uh, I, I planned February 1st, uh, but, I, you know, I was all the YouTubes and the, everything I was reading, everybody was posturing to get on up to, to Amicalola and, and get to Springer and get on up, start hiking. And I just was looking at that. I said, "The heck with this! It's, YouTube's <laughs> time is gone. It's, it's go time." I told I told my wife, "Let's let's get. Can you take me up there this weekend?" Wow! And my, my daughter was ready, and 
this was the weekend of the 29th. So we got on up there and it was, it was frigid and, and, uh, how frigid was it? I, I've, I've started, I've started in, in March and I've started in yeah. fe- end of February. I would imagine the end of January must be really cold. End of January. It was around 22 or so that, that first night, uh, there, there'd been a, I think there'd been a, a, a snow storm or, uh, prior to that. Oh, gosh. I think a few people had gotten off the trail and then, then that settled down a little bit. And I, we were able to get it on a sweet spot right there where it was, you know, it was just crunchy ice, crunchy, <laughs> crunchy snow and ice. And uh, we were able to walk along and right, we right. were fine, but we were, we were prepared for it with our, with our clothing and sleeping bags. And uh, yeah. I, was, I was not afraid. And, and you told me that before that, that your daughter had actually through height the trail, one of your daughters had through height the trail back in 2016, I believe it was. Yes. So she gave you some some help, I presume, as a um, uh, as a as a through hiker. Did she choose well for you, or did you know? Did she help you with your gear or what? She, she absolutely. She helped. Uh, she did a shakedown, tell me what I did, what I needed, and what I didn't need. And uh, I didn't follow her advice some of the times. You know, I I take the umbrella and I I took the bags within bags and. Uh, but she knew she, so she set me up for a, uh, we were going to hike the three days to Neil's gap and get the, uh, shakedown by the, right. by the pro there at the, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. at the outdoor, uh, uh, outdoor yeah, the, the, uh, the, new, the mountain crossings, mountain, mountain crossings. crossings. So yeah. 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 She worked hard to get me there and sure enough, he, he ditched everything that she, she knew <laughs> I, I needed to ditch. And so, uh, and I'm good. I'm pretty good. I'm a humble guy and I, took it all in stride and, and, and said, okay, take it, take it away. But you know uh, what, do you know what, if, if she hadn't been your daughter, Ted, if she was just a, a through hiker who lived near you and told yourself, you probably would have listened to her even more, wouldn't you? Probably. Because it was yeah. as, as a hiker. So it's quite interesting yeah. how people who've done this before do know what they're talking about because they've done it and they know what works and what doesn't work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so you you got going, and so on. was it harder than you thought to start with? Because I I, know, I think Georgia is quite a tough state personally, and it was certainly difficult for me. Did you find it harder than you'd expected to start oh, with? It was absolutely oh yeah, it blew my mind. It was absolutely hard. Uh, I was huffing and puffing up the hills. I was two hundred and forty eight pounds of, uh, you know, I was running and like I said, swimming. I was, but I was not. Uh, hiking shape is total, totally different uh, ball game there. Yeah. And uh, carrying the forty pounds I was carrying uh, at that at that time, and um, so I was huffing and puffing up the hills. I was taking a break every every ten steps, and uh, one minute uh, one mile per hour climbing, and uh, it was a it was a real it was the struggle was real, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> my and my daughter was just cruising on up through there, so she had felt that. You know, she had felt that pain before, and even though she had had desk jobs, you know, since 2016, 2017, you know, and she she still stayed in shape, but still, she was able to cruise on up through there, and she was doing well. Uh, I'm confident she was doing two two miles per hour up the hill, so uh, she was having to wait on me, but we did. We finally made it to uh, Neil's Gap. And how much uh, how much did they take out of your pack then? Did you how much did you lose? It got me down to 32 pounds. From and forty odd, so you had, yeah. you, had eight, you had eight eight pounds of stuff you didn't yeah, need. <laughs> I didn't need it. Didn't need it. Didn't need the entire medical kit of uh, band aids. You, you only need a couple of band aids, and that's right. You, only yeah. need, you know, he was stripping all that down and uh, fine tuning it. He uh, he did a great job. And uh, you said that, like me, you had a couple of face plants as well. Was that was that early on, or was that as you got through the hike? That was that was a little bit later. Uh, yeah, that was a little bit later. As my legs got a little more, uh, a little more tired, fatigued, and uh, uh, yeah, I'd, be, I'd catch a root and, and couldn't catch myself, and I'd just yeah. slam. And that, and that, that thirty-two pound, forty pound yes. pack would just take you, take you for a ride. Oh yeah, uh, it, it pushes you into the ground even further, yeah. doesn't it? And then your first, <laughs> your first thing is to throw your arms up to protect your head from hitting a rock, and then your arms take heavies. And so I was a I was a bloody mess, and it's like my family would just shake their head. They just didn't yeah. know if I could take. I said, you know, bulldog, you you can't take another hit like that. And <laughs> you know, well, eight or nine hits later, I'm still I'm still 
I'm like a Timex. I take a licking and keep on ticking. So, oh, nice, like yeah, it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and now I, I, I've often wondered, and, and I'm, in fact, I'm convinced now because, like, like me, you're you're in your sixties. I was in my sixties when I did both my hikes, and and I've often wondered if doing it in my sixties was actually a benefit to me because I'm not sure that I. I don't think I had the discipline when I was younger to do it. Have you? Did you wonder at all how different your height might have been had you done it 40 years ago? Or are you glad you did it when you were 60 anyway? I'm glad I did it now because I still thrive for the challenge. Uh, and we can get to that what would your 20 year old, What would your 27-year-old self have done with this hike? Oh, I would have, I would have, I would have done the trying to go, go for the fastest known time, probably. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm serious. I'm serious. I would have. Uh, yeah, this would have been uh, all. This would have been to the wall. This would have been full, full ahead, full steam ahead. So, uh, yeah. Um, but you know, 20 years ago, the, the equipment was. I would have probably been carrying 50 pounds Jeez. of equipment back then. You know, it was just wasn't light. I wasn't manufactured in a, a, a super light. So, uh. well, actually, that that leads me to uh, you know, there's a there's one of our listeners. Um, she's friends of the show. Her name's Betty, and she's planning a through hike next year. She wanted an answer to a couple of questions. I'm going to ask one of them now. What was your best gear choice when you were out there? Best gear choice was a, a ten degree uh, lightweight sleeping quilt, right? With a that zippered up. It was it zippered right. up. Yeah. And, so you uh, could keep one. So did that work th- throughout the whole hike, even when you got it, to the warm even, days yeah. in Virginia? Even when yeah. I got it got to the hotter hotter days, it just yeah, I put it over the top of me at about sure. you know four in the morning when it got really kind of chilly up north. And uh, cool, I, you know, honestly, the the uh, gentleman at REI that I, believe it or not, I passed on the trail way back when in in the winter, and he was southbound. We met him one night in a in a uh, in a shelter, sure. and uh, sure enough, I went to a little graduation down in uh, Virginia uh, uh, during the during the hike and uh, for a granddaughter, and uh, he was working at an REI. He, so so I was able to get a get a sleeping mattress uh, exchanged, and he told me you don't you don't just use the sleeping bag you have. You don't need another cool. lightweight, you know. 50 degree sleeping bag just use and sure enough i was able to i said okay well i'll save that money good uh, all right yeah so. and when we spoke before i asked if being a military man you were on a mission and you immediately said yes yeah. but then you then you added that i didn't have to enjoy it and you also said that parts of your hike you enjoyed talk to us about that because I, I've, not, I've rarely met somebody who didn't really enjoy the whole thing so so tell me the bits you didn't enjoy and what, and what did you enjoy Oh, it's, um, I didn't enjoy the, like I said, I was, I was going in too heavy. It was really, uh, playing with my mind a little bit, uh, how to reduce the weight and still be able to eat properly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I would, I would send stuff home and I almost sent my Crocs home. I'm glad I didn't send my Crocs. Somebody recommended you don't need those Crocs. Uh, but I, I did, I did. I needed to afford forward a couple of streams yeah. and rivers there so yeah sure uh so i didn't want to do without my crocs and uh but uh, it was a struggle with the weight i had it was keeping me off balance and i wish i could have uh golly I had two thousand miles you think you could correct stuff like that but i, I never <laughs> did i went i went heavy all the way all the way i think i was 40 pounds when i got wow. to uh, but wow. I, I attributed it to the food i had uh um, yeah yeah, and, uh, did I, I planned far better with my food the second time. I, I planned to get into town with nothing in my pack, yeah. which is a bit of a dangerous thing to do in many ways, because because I was I, my, I figured that if, even if I couldn't quite get into town, it wouldn't kill me to, to go out, go without food for one night, you know, and then yeah. I'd get into town the next day because carrying food in the because I went first time. My ex-wife sent me so much food mm-hmm. that I needed two food bags, mm-hmm. and I was giving food away in the shelters. So having you know to, to to plan your food to go into town with exactly none, it worked out for me, and that certainly helped keep my weight down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and while you may have been on a mission, um, the trail does give us endless hours of introspection, doesn't it? It does. Did you engage in some of that naval gazing? And, and if you did, did you work much out when you were on the trail? I did. I, I was able to, uh, you know, you think about 
things. I always wanted to pr- improve. I, I, I always wanted to learn something from from each hiker I met. I wanted to learn something nice. uh, from that uh, individual. And uh, you know, you know, I try to ask the right questions, and, and sure enough, you you'd pick up some tidbit and and that. So, but as far as uh, personally, mentally, I felt comfortable. Uh, uh, just being out there in the outdoors and, and, the, and the challenge of it. If I had some, I only had a couple of bad days where I would come sure. out of a resupply and I just felt like a, a, a hostile, you know, a stay over, a Nero. We like, we like Nero's uh, yes. in the family. We would try to get in into a hostel early and get, get out the next day at about lunchtime. And so get a Nero, but that was, that was always stressful for me because, you just couldn't get any rest. And I come out of there, you just because you're shopping, you're resupply, you're going into the grocery store, doing your laundry, doing, doing your the laundry, laundry, things like that. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's like you couldn't rest. You, I needed to get off my feet, kind of, and, and chill, and uh, and and just couldn't. You couldn't do that uh, yeah. unless you took a took another zero, which you, I, I would never have gotten finished. You know, if I did all that, yeah. uh, so. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the challenge and getting uh, and making those milestones of the hundred miles, the two hundred miles. Great moments, and, aren't they? Yeah, great moments. Great moments. It's just such a morale booster. Yeah, keeps you yeah. keeps you going. The halfway mark, Harper's Ferry was 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 a great. Uh, you know, Damascus, Harper's. So all those places uh, was a great morale booster. It just keeps you going. And uh, I didn't have to. I didn't have to like it. I just had to do it. Like I said, uh, <laughs> I don't have to like it. Yeah. I'm comfortable. I was comfortable with bug bites, bl- bruises, blisters, rain, uh, scrapes, cuts. I'm comfortable with all that. On honestly, from because of my pr- what previous you done? jobs. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so it didn't just. Oh yeah. It's raining. Okay, it won't be raining in a few. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It won't be raining in a few minutes. It'll uh, stop. It'll, it'll stop. Yeah. It'll stop. Uh, <laughs> and you mentioned your tramley. Um, you hyped them for quite a while, didn't you? Was was that a deliberate thing, or it just kind of was it one of those things that just happens that you put a group of people together walking about the same pace? We it's, it just happened. Uh, we were walking about the same pace. We had we had the same sense of humor, and uh, we, we just laughed. We laughed all the way up the trail. That's cool. So, so anything that went wrong, or we had a bad day, we could laugh our way out of it, and we just had a blast. Uh, it was, a, I love the tramley, and it just, it was, it was a bad day when they had to leave and go back uh, to farm, and and of course, sure, uh, and uh, but they came back. There's, they are right now. They're going through the Mahusik Notch. God, all right, <laughs> uh, uh, God bless them or help them. Uh, go with them, please, and you know, ensure their safety. But. Uh, uh, they're good and they make it. Did you find that your hike changed after they left, or did you just continue the way you were before? Because I, because I, I think it's a, it, it is a distinctly different hike when you do it by yourself yeah. to when you do it with other people. Oh, well, it changed. And it's, you know, the planning's all on me. It's not you don't have that group think. Yeah. It can be helpful. And it can be it can be great, and it can be a little risky. Group think can be a little bit risky, believe it or not. Uh, yeah. Uh, but. Uh, but it changed. I was, I was, the planning was on me solely. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do four days or five days. I used to like to do, it's crazy. I just like to stay out there about six days. That's why I was so heavy all the time. I planned yeah. for six days. Yeah. And, uh, and too much, too much, too, too much. And, yeah. uh, I, it, I realized that towards the end that you, you've got to figure out how to get to that gas station and you got to, you know, or that, that, that hostel that's some, That'll pick you up and a mile sure. down the road, and sure. you, whether you like it or not, you got to get in there and just kind of keep that weight off your back. Probably yep. could have done better with with uh, with water management, uh, you know. But you know what? You lost you lost more than the weight of your pack, so yeah. you actually lost that weight anyway, didn't you? So yes, I did. it, it, yeah. it becomes kind of easy. But uh, yeah. and this is on the show. I've heard me talk about the terrifying climb down from Mount Madison in the presidentials. Yeah. But you said you did it in the dark. Was that with, with your with your daughter yeah, as well? That was with my daughter. All right. Uh, how, how was that? That must have been a nightmare. That was a nightmare, and I just I made it. Uh, I made it an hour in the dark. <laughs> And uh, and I, I turned around to one individual that was trailing us. He was in the same boat. He was trying to get to the Osgood tent site. Yeah. And uh, he said, "Well, we, we still have another hour to go uh, down." I said, "Well, this is this is too dangerous. I can't." 
you know, even with a light on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just too dangerous uh, to skip down, to drop down to those the rocks like I was doing. Sure, sure. Uh, we were exhausted. We didn't come across the entire 13-mile ridge line that day uh, above the, you know, up above the alpine uh, zone, yeah, in, sure. in the alpine zone. And uh, and we just, we were fighting it's hard. Awesome. It is yeah. awesome, though, isn't it? It is absolutely it, beautiful, though, isn't it, it? it? It was great. We had a great day. The day before, they were pulling people off you know, due to bad weather. But uh, then, our, then the next day, we we were able to bypass all that and get on up there on a beautiful day. Uh, awesome. Got got down over Madison, and uh, <laughs> yeah. it's tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was for tough. for those of, those of you who haven't done this, <laughs> that done the climb down in Madison, if you ever want to try it to experience fear, go down Madison. You'll get it. <laughs> and I, I should think, oh. in Ted's case, going down it in the dark must have been even more crazy. Yeah. But anyway, you sprinted through the hundred mile wilderness <laughs> to get to Katahdin. So, and both, you said both your daughters climbed yeah. the time with you. That That's must correct. be tough from a standing start as well. Uh, you know? oh, it, oh, it was. Uh, you know, the one daughter uh, had just had her third uh, baby, the, uh, you know, nine months ago. There's a nine-month-old oh, right. involved. My wife was wow. watching was watching her at the, at the cabin. Yeah. But we want, I wanted to get her. We wanted to get her involved. She wanted to get involved. She went, you know, like a good daughter. She climbed with us. She made it. It was great. Yeah. Must have been really special to, yeah. to summit summit with with your kids as well, mustn't it? It was. It was it was it was the probably the best of the whole trip. Uh best time of yeah, the whole I trip. I bet. So. And I thought you had an interesting take on some of the the unnecessary stuff that we live with. You said look at hiker boxes and see what people discard. Yeah. I've never heard that before. Did that simple life appeal to you? And do you think you'll make, you could even see yourself making changes in your own life to make life simpler? I certainly have made life simpler for me. Oh yeah, it, absolutely. Um, I'm sitting here among a lot of electronics here on my, on my desk and I don't even care to turn the television on or watch the news anymore. And that, that was, if we ever got to the best, you know, what, what was the best part of this was, you know, unplugging from, from the yeah. news and television. And, uh, and, uh, of course I had to have the iPhone to follow my far out program, but, uh, sure, sure. couldn't get rid of it all, but, uh, but that was the best. Uh, yeah. yeah well, so, so, so let's come back to Betty's questions then. So what do you love? You love being able to disconnect. What did you hate about the trial? Uh, the fact that I was so discombobulated about, uh, about my, food and the resupplies i just couldn't stand going into a, a hostel and going shopping for food that i didn't like or want or, <laughs> uh, uh and I, made, I made it work but uh I'm washing the clothes and i just i, I swear i just would rather stayed out and hiked on but you know you can't do that uh, you get at a certain point you get so aggravated and you, you're tired of smelling your own you're smelling yourself and yeah oh yeah you need you need, need to get for health reasons you need to get cleaned up and you need to get you a good do. meal that getting you a good do. meal was a part of was the best <laughs> part of going in yes. uh, and i'd be frustrated you know you get up the trail get in some of these places and they'd have staff shortages of of in the restaurants and they're closed on they're closed on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but open on Wednesdays, only the two to three in the afternoon or, you know, Oh yeah. Cause they got crazy. church in it, church in the evening on a Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it, it's crazy. It was <laughs> crazy. Please bring, come back to work people, please. But, uh, 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 so you finished, Yeah, you finished with, with your girls there and that, and it's all over. Are you one and done or do you think you've got another long hike in you? Oh, I, oh I've got to come up with something. All right. I, I promise people I've, you know, I was joking around. I like to swim the English Channel. It's only like twenty one, twenty four miles across. So <laughs> I think I could do. It. I think I could do it. Well, maybe I'll do oh Alcatraz. My. Maybe I'll do Alcatraz or something. But it's some oh some swimming or, or biking. I got to. I got to think of something. Well, I tell you, man, you you look so you look so well. You know, I'm looking at you now. You've got this massive beard, by the way. <laughs> I kind of want to take. I'm not sure I can do this on the screen. I kind of want to take a picture of your beard. Sure. Getting rid. Of, oh, that's no, quick. Okay, getting ready to take it. I think it's yeah. taken it. There you go. All right. There you go. All right. Okay, <laughs> I've got a picture of you there. I sure. might put, if you don't mind, I might put that up because the beard yeah. is pretty magnificent. I tell yeah. you, crazy. Um, well, look, I tell you, I think you've done a, done a terrific job getting the getting the hike done. You're a very competitive guy, obviously, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and and telling us all about it. Oh, thanks, thanks, Steve. It was a pleasure being on, and uh, thanks for thanks for asking me to come on.
Well, good to talk to you. Okay, you take it easy and we'll speak soon. Okay. Cheers then. See ya. Bye. Bye. He is such a naturally curious guy, isn't he? Well, I've already said about wanting to find out something from each individual he met. I guess we all kind of do that too, though far less consciously. It's so much easier to connect with people when you're sitting down with them at the end of a long day's hiking and breaking bread with them. And Ted just kept going, didn't he? He didn't actually enjoy (laughs) some of it, but he was on a mission, so he did it. The mental game has to be so strong to get this done. Great stuff. And I know that I get a bit obsessed with that climb down from Madison, but you heard me talk about it just now with Ted. And, (laughs) I'll mention it later, with Katie. Those of you who have done it will know what I mean. It's a bloody nightmare, but epic at the same time. Before we hear from Trumpet, I wanted to quickly mention that our Woods Hole weekend is taking shape. I've been a little bit tardy in working out the details, but I'm getting there. We already have quite a bit of interest with several sign-ups and several inquiries. If you are interested in joining us for a great three days from lunchtime on Thursday the 6th of October to the end of lunch on Sunday the 9th of October, and you want to learn more, please email Neville at Woods Hole at Woods Hole Hostel at gmail.com. With a bit of luck, you should soon be able to see the full itinerary on our website at woodsholehostel.com. I hope to see some of you there. Now let's hear from Trumpet. Here he is. Morning. Hey Dan, how are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? You sound quite tired. How's it been? How's it been going? How's it been going? <laughs> I'm pretty good. Just recovering from uh, hiking in that heat wave for like two weeks. Was it that long? Tell me about it. Well, you know uh, that must have, that must have really drained your dog as well, didn't it? Yeah, it was not the best time. We uh, once we hit Vermont, I joined up with a friend there. Uh-huh. We hiked for two days, and then I took two days off. And then after that, um, it just started getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And I was meeting a friend in Dalton, so we just were doing like 20-plus miles every single day. Oh, gosh. And Vermont had water at least so we could cool ourselves down. But once we hit like Massachusetts and Connecticut, it just was so humid, so hot. Water was drying up. It was not definitely hard. Yeah, I've been wondering about that with this heap. I didn't know it'd been going on that long uh, up up there on the northeast. What's, what has the water supply been like? Have, have people been leaving stuff out for you? There have been a good amount of water caches. Um, people doing a lot of trail magic, which is the nice part about like Massachusetts and Connecticut. Sure. But yeah, I mean, even the even the big flowing brooks are just like tiny little puddles, so you can like get a trickle of water, but you can't can't take a dip anywhere and actually cool mm. yourself down. Well, of course, when you get to New Hampshire and Maine, you should, well, particularly Maine, you'd be able to, be able to swim a lot, so you should be should be fine with that. I know you've been in Maine. You've, sorry, you, you've, been, Maine. you've already just realised you've done <laughs> Maine. You're heading south again, aren't you? <laughs> just looking at I my know, notes I here. feel like it's slowly getting worse and worse. I tell all the Novos, like, you're going to have so much fun. It's going to be amazing. You're going to have a great time. And they're like, about New York and New Jersey. And I go, I know. Uh, so how far are you going to go now then? Uh, just about 300 ish miles to Harper's Ferry. And then I'm going to do an extra 200 miles to meet my parent in Shenandoah. And right. they're going to hike a few days with me. Nice. That's nice. So, of course, going south again, you are be- meeting up with some old friends. Has that been, have you enjoyed that part of the hike? It's been really, really cool. Um, every, it's pretty much every other day. I ran into like three people that I know. And it's like, oh, I saw you in. Tennessee or oh we hiked in North Carolina and sure, it's sure. just great to see that they're still going and real real full circle kind of experience. Are you feeding them by the way? <laughs> still cooking for them? Yeah um, I haven't been able to do as much trail magic now but when I hit Pennsylvania I have some friends from college I'm going to come meet up with and we're going to do some trail magic. And a friend of yours came from Colorado I understand and with her dog to hike with you um, so what was that like? Because, you know, you've it's just been you and Frankie all the way. Now suddenly there's somebody else and their dog. Did that change the balance of your hike? Yeah, yeah, it definitely did. Uh, so we met on the Colorado Trail because she also threw hikes with her very large dog, even bigger than my dog, actually. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, a German short-haired pointer. Um, 
But, yeah, I mean, I definitely had to slow down because, you know, she hasn't been hiking for four months. But we still averaged, like, 15 a day. We took a zero when it was, like, 95 degrees out. And um, I will say it was very nice to have company during that insufferable, insufferable heat because, you know, I would have been really, really upset by myself. But at least I was only, like, kind of upset and with my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you doing to cope with it? Are you trying to hike le- earlier and later so you don't, you're not out there in the middle of the day? Pretty much. We would, like, get up at 3 in the morning and then start hiking, do as many miles as we can. And then maybe like pop into town and we would sit like underneath a bunch of trees behind a gas station for three hours. I remember I bought a bag of ice and I just had Frankie lay on it for a couple hours. That was a good time. Yeah. Well, I I recall some guy uh, when I hiked, I think it was in 2019, he would take three hours off in the middle of the day and just sleep in a shelter because, of course, they're undercover there. Uh, And uh, he loved it. He said it just revitalized him and allowed him to carry on hiking another 10, 12, 15 miles in the afternoon quite easily. Wow. I get too sleepy after a nap. I know what you mean, though. Yeah, if you wait till you get to my age, you have a nap and the, and the, the, the day's finished. And you put in your notes to me that um, Massachusetts you thought was flat. You must have bit missed parts of Massachusetts that I went up. Tell me about that. I mean, obviously it wasn't completely flat, like people say about Virginia. But compared to – I'm really thinking, like, after the nonsense in southern Maine and most of the whites, I mean – Everything in comparison is just like, whatever, <laughs> I can go up and down one time. Like, as long yeah. as I'm not going up, straight up and straight down for 200 miles, this is the, a cakewalk. So yeah. I want to do yeah. my first 30 after I, I'm done visiting my grandma here. Your first, what, 30? I want to do like 32, 35 miles. Is Frankie up for that, do you think? Oh, uh, 100%. We, we had to do a couple 25s back to back. Right. Uh, to meet up with my friend on time, and he was sprinting the last two miles. Um, oh, if we did yeah. do that, I'd probably carry his backpack most of the day, but he is, anytime I have ever doubted him, he has shown me he is far more than capable uh, than doing this. Are you still enjoying it? Oh, yeah. Oh, he's having a great time and meeting lots of people. And, yeah, no, right now we're just resting, and every day I can see he's like, why are we not hiking? I want to be <laughs> hiking. <laughs> So has this given you the appetite, you think, to hike more long-distance trails with Frankie in the future? Is, is, have you started on this trip to start thinking about what happens next year and the year after and so on? Oh, I've already got uh, three more trails planned. <laughs> that is huh. 100% on the docket. I want to do the Colorado Trail again next summer, but I want to huh. add like an extra 400 miles of like side trails. Right. Um, possibly the Oregon Coast Trail with my friend who I just hiked with. And then next, next summer, when I have another dog, and depending on how well Frankie is doing, the CDP. Oh, you're going to go with another dog as well? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting dog number two after this trail. Oh, wow. And, and is there a certain type of dog you've been looking for? Because not every dog can do this, can they? No, no, of course not. I mean, it's not, not every dog was meant for it. But, yeah, definitely double-coated. Cause I like to do cold-weather stuff. Um, and just like looking, looking, seeing what the dogs are like. Um, I have a friend who, uh, what you call it, works at a humane society in Colorado. So I've asked right. him to keep me updated, but I am in right. no rush. I will look at a thousand shelters until I find the dog that has a lot of energy and more importantly is friends with Frankie. So, yeah, I'm sure that's going to be important as well. Yeah. Well, look, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're going at it. You're still enjoying it. And, and you're absolutely right. I, I, and I've thought about this with the Soboers and so on. When they've done those first two states, you know, they've done the majority of the really, really tough stuff on the Appalachian Trail, but it's still keeping yourself going. For me, for me to go north, I was keeping myself going partially because I knew the excitement of those last two states. And I just wonder what that feeling is once you've been through the excitement of those last two states, what it's like for the for the next few states. Are you you still as up as you were before? I mean, it's definitely a little more boring, (laughs) for sure. I've definitely (laughs) delved a lot more into listening to podcasts and whatnot. But, you know, at this point, since I'm I'm so close to the end, pretty much, I don't have the entire South to go through. It's more of just kind of like finishing what I set out to do, enjoying the little bit that I can, and, you know, deli blazing and stuff. But (laughs) more just about... Coming, coming full circle on this thing, which I'll be very excited to do. 
And so with 300 miles to go, how long do you reckon it's going to be before you finish? Uh, just for those 300 miles, probably three weeks, two and a half weeks, something like right, that. Right, right. Exciting. Exciting. Okay, man. Well, look, good to catch up with you. I'm glad that Frankie came through the, came through the heat and you came through the heat uh, unscathed. And hopefully it's going to start. Let's look at the weather forecast. It looks like it's cooling down now anyway. Is it feeling better, better for yeah. you now? It's much better. It's like high 70s, low 80s. It's as long as it's not in the 90s, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it must be must be a nightmare that temperature. Okay, man. Well, look, good to talk to you. Uh, and keep it up, and uh, we'll probably catch up again next week because you're now on the the last few uh, you know throws of your hike. And uh, yeah, we'll try to talk talk again next week. Okay. That's great. All right, Dan. Take it easy. All right. All right. Bye bye. Cheers, then. Bye. He's still got the joy in his heart, hasn't he? He's had hot weather, and he still laughs about everything. Looking forward to catching up with him again next week, though I may well miss his finish because I'm going to be in California. And actually, talking about California, Chris Casado was actually one of our guests some time ago, and he's leading our TSX challenge out there next Thursday. He let me know that there is still one place available because unfortunately Jester had to cancel. If one of you would like to take her place and hike with me and Chris and a couple of our listeners, plus a bunch of others, of course, then quickly email Chris. And he's at chris at tsxchallenge.com. Maybe I'll see you out there on that one. Now, Katie, just a few days from the end of her hike. Here she is. Hi, Steve. Hey, Katie. How are you? I'm on my third day of rain. <laughs> oh, nice. I, that, now, you're, you're out of um, the whites and everything, the presidentials. Tell me how the, that last couple of days went. Well... It was difficult. <laughs> really? Good Lord. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a surprise. Yeah. No, no, no. They So Washington from Lake of the Cloud wasn't too bad. And, and that was kind of fun to see. And then took the trail from Washington to Madison Spring Hut. And that was that was a very difficult traverse. That was all day, all day, all rocks. <laughs> oh, so, so from Madison down to Spring, from Spring. Madison so, down. No, first, first of all, talk talk about Lake of the Clouds Hut because no, we've had nobody talk about that since we've been on any of the huts, really. So talk yeah. about the hut. Yeah. Well, I I thought it was nice. It's 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 like the I think it's the biggest hut. So yes, the, yes. it was a lot of people, yeah. and I, I think I like the smaller huts the best. I did stay at Zealand Falls, and I liked that one. Sure. And I did stay at Madison Spring, and I liked that one. Um, Lake of the Clouds was was lovely, but it was big and crowded, and you know it was mostly uh, people there on vacation. Yeah, I yeah, think and yeah. kids work hard, don't they? Don't you think the kids work hard there? <laughs> I do. I do. I just love those workers. <laughs> yeah, they do great yes. job. So, so you left. What time did you leave to start up Washington? Because it's not that long a hike up Washington, is it? No. You know, I, I think probably around like 8.30. Right. You know. Okay. And what was it looking yeah. like? What was it looking like that day? It was foggy, but not, uh, you know, it was a little misty, a little foggy, but but the wind was low, so that was not bad, and there were no storms in the forecast. Nice, so nice. didn't really have a view, but you know it can, you know that kind of stuff can be neat even in the clouds. But the neatest so, thing after that climb is the is the restaurant at the top, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. They weren't open yet when I got oh, there. Right, so right. The, uh-huh. So I just grabbed, you know, a soda and. A snack. <laughs> so you start heading off down, and pretty soon I think you come to the Cog Railway, don't you? Did you see the train? Uh, yes, several. They kind of went down. Uh, sorry, I'm by a highway. Okay, it's the only place I could get cellular. Sure. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of neat because it'd come out of the fog. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, oh yeah, I bet yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was neat. That was neat, and, and I no, the, I didn't moon. I did not moon anyone. I, I would. I wouldn't ask you, <laughs> but I was thinking exactly that. But uh, okay, <laughs> so, didn't but, want to frighten the children. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, oh so God. you carried on the climb down from there. You found that quite tricky, did you? Um. Oh my gosh, it was so hard. I don't know. You know, I think it was just 
um, I think it was just that it was all rocks. You were just stepping from one rock to the next rock. So, you know, I had underestimated how hard it'd be. It, you know, I didn't have any problems like falling or anything, but I did, you know, it did take me a while. So, but you know what? On any rocks, wherever you are, is Pennsylvania is the obvious place, but one, two other places, and certainly New Hampshire and Maine, you just have to take your time and you just have to pray it's not wet, don't you? I mean, that, that would be the, right. wor- that would be the worst right. thing. So what was your day like then? So you went from Lake of the Clouds Hut to Madison. How far actually is that? Um, I'm thinking maybe close to eight miles. I'm surprised yeah. it's that far, actually, in, in my it, mind. Yes, it is. I would say seven or eight miles. Okay. So you yeah. got to so you got to Madison, um, and that was your end of that day, and you stayed in that hut as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you enjoy, and you enjoyed that one? Yes. Yes, I did. And I enjoy sleeping on a cushion. Is that? <laughs> there is that, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not luxury. Yeah. It's, you know, people need to know it's not luxury accommodation, but it's kind oh, of – Oh, it is not luxury. Yeah, no, 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 no. There's no electric outlet. No, there's I know. No yeah. sh- there's no sh- – you don't shower. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very – very rustic. You people know, pay a lot of money. Lamp. People pay a lot yeah, of money exactly. to remain rustic, don't they? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Anyway, so the next morning um, was Madison up, was that, my favourite mountain right of up all. Madison, which is like a big pile of boulders. <laughs> yeah, but didn't you didn't yeah, you think so that was thrilling? It, it was. It was awesome when you could get to the top. We actually, I had a view. You know, you could see the valley for the first time in like a couple of days, Lovely. and you could look back on Washington, yeah. Mount Washington, yeah, yeah. and and all while you were hiking down, there were you had like a couple of hours you could see Mount Washington, <laughs> so that was pretty neat. And and you know, I didn't mind the hike down. It, really, it, it reminded me a lot like uh, Maine. You know, there are lots of trees to help you get down and. You know, but you're literally hanging on to the roots of trees while you <laughs> slide on your backside down, aren't you? I mean, it's it's a bit of a mission sometimes. Uh, yep, <laughs> you sure are. Yeah. Oh so you gosh, eventually, so, so, so that led you all the way down to where? It took me to Pinkham Notch, right, and bit. past the Osgood uh, campsite yeah, where it levels out, out yeah, and yeah. then then you get to Pinkham Notch and. Um, the fun, the funny part of it was my friend Rachel and I were trying to connect so we right. could hike out together. Right. And we never, we never, I, she doesn't have the app I have. And, and I think, you know, we were hiking around each other uh-huh. and then we never connected, but she sent me a text later saying, I left you something. And it was like a scavenger hunt i had to go find <laughs> and she'd left me a beer and some chocolate under nice. a pine tree <laughs> nice nice uh, yeah special anyway, special so. treat so so you got to pink yeah. and notch so was that the end of new hampshire maine for you that was the end i had already done the wildcat yes yeah of course the, yeah the neat thing is oh my gosh i could not believe this first of all i was quite manic when i got down <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm done. Yeah. I did it. <laughs> and the shuttle driver uh, who actually shuttled me last year picked me up uh, to take me back to my car in Lyme, uh-huh. New Hampshire. And you wouldn't believe it, Steve. We're driving, and within a 15 minute span of time, saw five bears. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, hopefully, they're know, all, hopefully, they're all alive. You didn't see them on the road, did you? Oh no no no! They right. they were quite healthy. One was a mother with two cubs, Lovely. and then saw another one as we drove by. We slowed down real carefully, and that guy looked me in the eye as I went. <laughs> 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 and then the other one was standing on his haunches, eating from a tree. Nice. It was so cool. I could not believe it. And the only thing I can think is, you know. Uh, it's getting end of summer up there, and they're like all desperate to eat. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Do you know what though? I'm I, I I've seen animals from a car 
and I've seen animals, but I'm be, I've been in the woods walking. It just isn't the same thing at all, oh, no, is it? No, 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 <laughs> no. But I was surprised to see so many. Yeah, so, yeah. So that was really strange. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so, you, so on reflection, the whites and Maine, have they been in general tougher than you'd imagine they would be when you first started this, or have, or have they just lived up to everybody's, rep, you know, the reputation of this fantastic, fin- normally this fantastic finish to the Nobo uh, hike? Mm-hmm. You know what I did? Yeah. So I, there's always fear mongering. There's always, you know, Oh, sure. you sure. know, Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and, and I will grant it. It was, Maine and the presidentials were definitely the the toughest hikes I've ever done. Yeah, but yeah. you know, you you're rewarded because you see um you know the the views are amazing, the you know just the trails are amazing, just knowing that you're having the chance to get out there and do it, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, well I think I think the more it's, it's interesting what you just said there about you get you're rewarded because it's something that people say to you down south. You know, you're rewarded by getting to the top of that hill. You get this great view, but man, that is multiplied twenty times, isn't it? When you get to New Hampshire and Maine, once you've got the decent weather, the mm-hmm. view of being above mm-hmm. the clouds and everything is just remarkable. Yep. Oh, yes. I, I love yes. that. I love that. So, yes, it you, dr- was you drove back amazing. down south. You drove back down south, and um, mm-hmm. what did you go home? What did you do? Nope, didn't go home. I I Good. am at. Well I started at uh, Glasgow. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, five, I think it's five oh one, and and I'm on my third day now. Right. And so it's rained. Every day. <laughs> what sort of miles are you doing, Katie? What sort of miles are you doing each day? Um, I'm not doing big miles because I I am carry I carried seven days of food, so my pack is really wow. heavy. Why'd, so, you do, why'd you do that, Katie? Well, because I don't want to get off. I, right. I don't want to get off the trail. I want to stay on until I'm done. Right. And so I just, it, you know, it, it'll be six nights and I'll walk out on day seven. Right. And so, you know, I'm just eating as fast as I can, Steve. <laughs> 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 the thing is, you get, you could to reduce your weight, you could eat all the food, and then you still have to get up to get some more food, would you? <laughs> right, right. Oh, dear. So where are you? Where yeah, are you right now? Then so, where are you right now? Uh, right now, I'm on uh, Route 60, and I'm getting ready to go up. I think it's called Knob. Uh, I forget what it's called. High Knob Mountain, right. I think. Right. And then I mean High. High Knob Mountain or High Bald okay. Mountain, and then there's Coal Mountain just after that, which is a place I, I actually hiked over before, and oh. it is, it's a big bald that's just beautiful. Beautiful, so, I love the boards, love the boards. Yeah, so me tell, too. So, so tell me, what day have you? What day have you scheduled to finish? I, I think I'm going to finish on Saturday. And what's the plans? Yeah. What's the plans? Your family coming down to hike with you? Uh, well, my daughter, my oldest daughter uh, is bringing uh, her two children right. and she's going to pick me up and I'll then I'll go back to get my car at Stanimals where I've left it for the week. Sure. Um, and then um, and then on Sunday, we're having a big family party. So Lovely. Be, That's beautiful. It'll be, it'll be nice. And I'm, I'm excited about it. Well, look, if, you you're, if you finish on the Saturday and you've got five minutes uh-huh. just to call me when you finished, we can record. I'd love sure. to record you the moment you finish. It'd be pretty cool to do that. Oh, that sounds great. Let's hope that it, stop, let, let's hope oh it stops gosh. raining by then as well. Oh, <laughs> Man, <laughs> I will be thoroughly done if it's still raining. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, enjoy the next yeah. few days, Caddy. I'm I'm delighted right. that this is is working out the way you hoped it would work out, and I'm t- super yeah. proud to have uh, supported you throughout. So hopefully uh, you enjoy the next few you, days. Steve. Just enjoy it. These are mo- these are the Steve. moments. These are the moments. I'm I am staying in the moment. <laughs> okay. I'm trying. All right, Caddy. We'll speak. We'll All speak right. Saturday. Okay. Hopefully, then. All right, Steve. Okay. Bye. 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 I so hope I can record her as she finishes. She'll have family with her and they'll realise what an epic journey she's had. And I'd like to also take the time to thank several of you listeners for reaching out to me to meet her and even hike with her. It means a lot to me that you care and I know that it's meant a lot to Katie as well. Talking of thanks, we've had recurring donors stick with us this week, including Todd Withrow, Sabre Thompson, Suzanne Johnson, John Krautler and Betty McEnany. 
Also, Jen Haley donated as well. Thank you so much to you all. Finally today, the epic sixth chapter of Then the Hail Came. And our hero is feeling a little bit down on himself, though his mood is elevated by his experiences in the glorious Rhone Highlands. No wonder. I'll see you next week. Thursday, the 2nd of June, 1983, mile 368.8. It turned out to be option number two. I was very tired this morning and could not drag myself out of the sleeping bag until past 8.30. By the time I got started, it was almost 10 o'clock. That effectively ruled out options three and four before I even left the shelter. Not that it really mattered, I just did not have it today anyway. The trail was rough. The mile from the shelter to the cliffs on Little Rock Knob was straight uphill. Another gorgeous day and a nice series of views made that climb worthwhile. I made my way along the cliffs feeling tired but exhilarated. Three words which describe my condition over much of the course of the day. A sharp plunge and a couple of steep-sided knobs rounded out the first two miles of the day. From the bottom of Hughes Gap, I began the fabled ascent of Rhone Mountain. The initial climb out was deceptively mild, but the endless slope gradually became steeper. Groaning and trudging along on legs not far recovered from yesterday's exertions, I just had to turn off my mind and keep plodding ahead, until the trail levelled off atop Beartown Mountain a minor summit of Rome. A short side trail led to a decent viewpoint up there, but my legs felt like they had just tackled Everest. There is never a damned Sherpa around when you need one. The AT dipped down slightly into Ash Gap and followed moderate grades from there almost to the top of Rome, but one more thigh killer was lurking right at the end. Before I dragged myself onto the crest of a grassy little knoll and the sprawling summit plateau unfolded before me, my legs gratefully kissed the ground as I collapsed into one spent heap. I'd like to think that had Billy Martin been there, he would have patted my butt. A beautiful fir and spruce forest from out of my homesick daydreams of New England almost made me forget the preceding ordeal. It was one of those crisp, sun-washed days when the sky just seems to sparkle. Extensive swathes of bluets carpeted the open areas, the first thriving specimens of my little blue friends from earlier spring days that I've seen in weeks. I crossed a paved road which came up from the valley below and came upon a roadside picnic area with tables, trash cans and water fountains. It seemed a perfect spot to take lunch and attempt to regroup. It was a nice view of the valley and I simply wanted to spend more time atop my last 6,000 footer for almost 1,500 miles. At that point, any hopes for a big mileage day were already shot. I'd chewed up more than three hours in covering less than five miles. So much for Elk Park. After lunch, I stopped briefly at Roan Hydenom Shelter to read the register, leaving a strange entry of my own, which may someday turn up in these pages, before leaving. Now that I'm hiking alone, I intend to be a little more imaginative with my entries. I enjoy reading the warped creations of some of the hikers ahead of me, and hope that those behind will feel the same way about mine. I passed up a side trail to Roan's famous wild rhododendron gardens. As demonstrated by the presence of bluets, spring was not yet far enough advanced up there for rhododendrons to be in bloom. I followed the Appalachian Trail down into Carver's Gap and began to traverse a magnificent series of lofty boards known collectively as the Rhone Highlands. A paved road ran through Carver's Gap. Many cars were parked adjacent to the AT crossing. The trail up Brown Board, the first summit of the Highlands, was packed with day hikers wearing parkas and other heavy winter clothing. They must have thought me strange in my shorts and t-shirt, but what could they say as I blew by them carrying a heavy backpack as a handicap? It was a chilling day to be standing around, but a nice steep half-mile climb sort of gets your blood going. Few of those people made it very far before the coats, hats and gloves started to come off. Beyond Carver's Gap, for more than two miles, the ridge crest was a long, undulating meadow sprinkled with thousands of bluets. Near the top of Round Board stood a small cluster of red pines. I read in my guidebook that the U.S. Forest Service had planted them years ago in order to determine if red pine would grow on natural boards. Hey, somebody had to do it, right? The world is far richer for having this knowledge. None of the day hikers continued past Round Bald. I was alone on the open ridge for the rest of the way. I spent more time enjoying the immense panoramas and taking pictures than I spent hiking seriously. I just could not rush through a place like that. Many miles of far less enchanting scenery stretch through the central states of the Appalachian Trail. I can pick up my pace then. After rolling along the ridge crest over Jane Board and Grassy Ridge, 
The AT left the open fields behind and plunged steeply down a wooded slope into Low Gap. I probably would have spent the night there in Roan Highlands shelter had not the place itself been such an armpit. Thanks to some thoughtful campers, the spring was a filthy trickle, garbage was strewn all over and the area was infested by mice. It was truly a shame. The location was wonderful. I sat there uselessly for an hour as the afternoon trickled away. I knew I had to move on or face a night of unpalatable water and pillaging mice, but I could not seem to work up any enthusiasm. The elation of the open ridge walk gradually faded, leaving me feeling listless and run down. I drifted half-heartedly back onto the trail at six o'clock, eventually pitching my tent in a field of high grass in Yellow Mountain Gap, where I ended an 11.3 mile day. So much for the lean, mean mileage machine. Later for you. The guidebook mentioned a trail to the left and a grassy track to the right, both leading to water. The trail quickly petered uselessly out. Three overgrown old rows led downhill to the right. I tried them all, one by one. After following the last one for a half mile without a sign of water, I decided to give up and hike to the next Appalachian Trail campsite. While walking back, I heard a faint trickling, barely discernible above fluttering leaves in the nearby woods across a barbed wire fence. I may have said a little prayer while straddling the cruel-looking barbs, all my weight balanced precariously on the bottom strand of wire as I climbed over. I seem to remember my sex life flashing before my eyes in a few desperate moments, the recent portion doing nothing to cheer me. Somehow I made it back to the campsite with water and a full complement of body parts. I slipped into a deep catatonic state upon returning. While darkness fell and dinner sat uncooked in the backpack, I sat on the ground playing with my toes and contemplating my navel for about an hour. I was simply played out, physically and emotionally. I just could not seem to work up much of an appetite. Eventually, I fixed myself some instant potatoes, ate a couple of Pop-Tarts and stretched out inside my sleeping bag. I felt so low. I still do. Where did this come from? I've not seen Dave since Hot Springs. It appears I've seen the last of him on this journey. It was good company. I will probably go the rest of the way basically alone. I may hook up with another hiker for a day or so here and there, but it seems improbable that I will find fast friendship or that calibre again in such a short span of time. I will not embarrass myself again by setting any kind of mileage goals for tomorrow. I would like to make up for today, but I will have to go easy and recoup some strength. With my luck, it will probably rain. Friday, 3rd of June, 1983, mile 381.1 Something happened yesterday which I did not have the courage to write about. I was too ashamed. Today, I'm going to come clean. It was the end of that long, exhausting trek up Rhone Mountain. I stood upon the plateau, a feeling of warm contentment easing my fatigue. An anticipation of an impending event of wonderful momentousness filled my being. Suddenly I was seized by a sense of being watched. Whirling around, I confronted the largest vulture I had ever seen. More than eight feet tall with a huge round beer belly, he was standing beside the trail, picking his teeth with a broken piece of Kelty pack frame. I was immediately struck by his eyes, dark and ancient and filled with the wisdom of ages. A tingle of elation ran through me. He seemed about to impart upon me a nugget of deep cosmic truth. A slight change of expression darkened his visage. He gazed searchingly into my eyes, apparently judging my worthiness to receive this precious gift. Clearing his throat, he asked, How many three-cent stamps in a dozen? Four! I shot back, quickly and confidently. A sudden flurry of powerful wings and wind whipped painfully against my skin. A terrible spasm of horror seized my heart as I realised my awful mistake. Twelve, I shouted, twelve, twelve! But it was too late. He was gone. I stood alone on the mountaintop, shame and despair washing over me. After that, the rest of the day was shot. I slept the sleep of the dead last night. So exhausted, I did not even wait to water the grass until 6.30 in the morning. The sky had completely clouded over during the night and hung low and threatening above my tent. I crawled back inside and zipped myself back into my sleeping bag. Moments later, I heard the first drops of rain spattering off the tent fly. They stopped after a few minutes, but I knew they would return. I sank back for a while into my dark and gloomy dreams. I awoke for the day at eight o'clock, threw my clothes on and went outside to make breakfast. The sun was shining and not a cloud was in sight. The outside of my tent was dry. Did I dream the rain? Disgusted with myself for again sleeping so late, I made breakfast and wolfed it down. While cleaning up, I looked overhead. 
Clouds as black and depressing as my dreams had been filled the sky. Did I dream the sun? I packed up my gear as fast as possible, but didn't hit the trail until 9.30, feeling totally worthless. It was a mile and a half from my campsite in Yellow Mountain Gap to Little Hump Mountain, the next bald summit of the highlands. Along the way, I crossed an open, grassy spur of Yellow Mountain. The sun was shining and the clouds were breaking up. Strange morning. Outside, the weather remained mostly sunny for the rest of the day. Inside my soul, the clouds also lifted a little. I challenge anyone who loves beauty to walk through the Rhone Highlands on a nice day and remain miserable. There were unbroken vistas from the trail all along the west slope of Little Hump Mountain to its summit. The east side, as I descended into Bradley Gap, was somewhat more overgrown but still had frequent viewpoints overlooking the trail ahead to the summit of Hump Mountain. Of all the mountains I have seen on this hike, Hump is now my favourite. Rhone had been my previous choice, so it has obviously been a very scenic past couple of days. I named this chapter, what did you think I meant, after those two wonderful peaks. The 14 miles of trail between Little Rock Knob and Hump Mountain traverse one of the most superb stretches of scenery I have ever encountered. The climb up Hump was a bear, but the views from every inch of the trail lightened the load. Like Round Board, Jane Board and Little Hump, this summit had 360 degree views, but Hump Mountain was much higher and the panorama extended for miles in every direction. An intricate series of cross chains groped eastward towards the Blue Ridge's long eastern fork, while to the north loomed Virginia and Mount Rogers, its highest peak. The grassy highlands rolled southward to our own mountain's lofty, forested plateau. Some miles away to the west in Tennessee ran Iron Mountain, the long, lower range which parallels this western fork of the Blue Ridge. I'll be hiking its flat, wooded crest soon. I sat on top of Hump Mountain for almost an hour, drinking in views. The climb down was long and very steep. Obviously, southbounders will remember the climb up Hump Mountain, just as northbounders remember the ascent of Rhone. The east slope of Hump was densely forested from a point just below the summit and beyond. However, the Appalachian Trail broke out into the clear one last time, one mile later, at a place called Doll Flats. From this large, level meadow were great views southward into North Carolina, and to the west, one last excellent farewell look at Hump Mountain Summit. From Doll Flats, the Appalachian Trail descended north off the state line ridge into Tennessee, and I said goodbye to North Carolina as well, two states down. The path was a recent relocation, and the soft ground, not yet compacted by foot traffic, kept crumbling away beneath my boots. Many stretches were overgrown, and the route was constantly blocked by fallen trees. It was slow going most of the way to the bottom of that descent, at which point the Appalachian Trail crossed Tennessee Highway 19E. An addendum containing the information on this long relocation had been included with my Tennessee North Carolina guidebook, but I had stupidly forgotten to bring it with me. As a result of that omission, I had great difficulty finding where the Appalachian Trail went once it crossed the highway. When I finally found the trail, it turned out to be just as difficult and treacherous as that part of the relocation on the other side of the highway had been. The new trail route, for most of the distance from Don Neal and Shelter, either passed through private lands or followed rural lanes. From the highway, it climbed steeply through high pastures, baking it under a relentless sun. There were great views back towards Rhone and Hump Mountains from the tops of several of the fields, but I could not appreciate them fully. I ran out of water and my tissues were dehydrating rapidly along those shadeless stretches. There had been no lack of water sources. Running out was just carelessness on my part. My head has been somewhere else these past couple of days. I finally came to a stream just as the path began descending rather steeply through forest and a few small fields. The Appalachian Trail emerged from the woods at a small cemetery in the middle of nowhere and descended along its gravel access road. It came out on Walnut Mountain Road, a narrow rural hardtop, and followed it for a short distance past some houses and a church before re-entering the forest and dropping down into a wooded valley. After a short stretch of woodland trail, I came out onto more pavement, Campbell Hollow Road, which the AT followed for a mile, passing several small farms. Tennessee is known as one of the poorest states in the country, and the inhabited areas through which I walked today fit right in with that image. The Appalachian Trail passes through an amazing contrast of wealthy estates and rural poverty in these southern mountains. When the AT left this road, it descended again steeply on a footpath into a secluded wooded valley called Sugar Hollow. When I reached the floor of the hollow, I made my way along the side trail to Don Neal and Shelter through a morass of gummy black mud, a deep oozing quagmire which several times completely enveloped my boots. 
I dragged myself into the shelter at four o'clock, the proud owner of a big 12.3 mile day. Yes, I am a lean, mean, bullshit machine. I will never make Tarden. Never. If this is the best I can do, I may as well pack it in. It is 16.6 miles from here to Little Laurel Shelter. If I can do that tomorrow, and then squeeze one great day out of my whimpering, quitter's soul, maybe I will again begin to believe that I can do this thing. If not, then perhaps I'm just as useless as I think I am. We'll see. As it turned out, staying at the shelter was a decent decision. Not 15 minutes after I arrived, a drenching thunderstorm struck and hung around for about a half hour. The next shelter is nine miles away, so I would have been camping out tonight had I gone on. Perhaps by stopping this early, I can get to sleep before midnight and get an early start tomorrow morning. I definitely need to regroup. I'm in a deep, black abyss emotionally, which is probably apparent from the whiny, self-pitying crap which lately keeps creeping into my writing. I need a big boost to my fledgling self-esteem, and I need it soon. I need to believe in myself again. I need another finest hour. Physically, I'm run down, but some miraculous things have been happening. My pot belly is almost gone, and my calves are beginning to stretch the tops of my socks out of shape. The big miracle is the one happening to my feet. My blisters have turned into hard, thick calluses, which seem indestructible. The ones which cover the entire soles of my feet are like rocks. Another hard callus has formed directly over that scab on my little toe, and the wound that could never possibly heal while I was hiking is somehow beginning to heal beneath it. I no longer need to swathe it in band-aids and adhesive tape. Right now, my situation is almost the opposite of what it was when I was in the Smokies. I like what is happening to my body, but my soul is on the brink of defeat. Unfortunately, it has always been my soul which has let me down in the past.